I'm glad to be back for this third session. And if you've all been with me, whether through the first rec recording or throughout the sessions, uh, thank you for sticking with it. We are getting to this culminating part of how to deal with all this data that we now have, specifically focusing on this qualitative data. So the goal here is to make sure that we are paying attention to uh, the coding and the analysis of all this information that we got whether from focus groups, interviews, or from the observational research that we're engaging in. So what we hope to get through today, of course, is make sure we have a basic understanding of how to code qualitative data, including different types of coding approaches. And I'm going to introduce a lot of types, but I'm going to focus on the ones that I think are going to be most valuable and most applicable to the work you're doing, <clears throat> excuse me, in libraries. And also talk a little bit about how to analyze that observational data, which, you know, the nice thing about it is it's pretty much the same. Uh, we talk about how to get it into a structure to do the analysis. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about how do we connect this to the overarching questions or concerns that we face in libraries. Like, why would we even want to continue engaging and looking at this type of data that we're getting from observations, from focus groups, and from interviews? So first of all, a coding overview. And I specifically chose these images because they are very reflective of how coding can sometimes take place, whether you're working as an individual or you're working with a group of people. And there's this element of coding that is really just about organization. And you'll hear me talk about that um, off and on throughout this particular session. But coding itself is actually just one way that we can actually analyze qualitative data. Now, if we want to think about this in a technical term, we can say that coding is this application of meaning to information in order to later identify patterns or categories or themes for further understanding, processing, or even development of theories. But for me, it's really about being able to discover new things and then also stimulate our thinking about this data we have because when you think about data, especially data from interviews and focus groups and observational studies, it's a lot. It's a lot of data, a lot of information. And what coding allows us to do is make sense of that data. Now, a code in itself, if we use the definition by Saldana, and Saldana is one of the books that uh, there is actually a coding handbook out there. Um, and Saldana is the author of that coding handbook. And it's typically the one that almost everyone relies on for, for understanding coding. But I will say that even based on this definition, a lot of the text in that book is very much, it's, it's deep. It's almost theoretical. Um, so Saldana tells us that a code is a word or a short phrase that symbolically assigns a summative, salient, essence capturing, and or evocative attribute for a portion of language-based or visual data. And really all this means is that a code is a way for you to interpret or translate the data you have into something that's meaningful to you as a researcher. Um, the key parts of what Saldana tells us is that we're looking at a word or a short phrase. So a code doesn't actually have to be a single word. It actually can be a phrase. Um, you typically, though, want them to not get overly long. You don't necessarily want a code that's a sentence, uh, but a word or a short phrase that helps you to understand what you're actually looking at when you're looking at the data. Now, in terms of what you can code, just about anything that's either textual or visual. So of course, we can code interview and focus group transcripts. We can definitely code the open-ended survey questions we may have. So those are those questions that we had that were, tell us more, or can you describe, and you allow your participant to, to give you more data. And observation notes and memos. So we talked about doing an observation and, and sort of taking notes, or even as you're interviewing or doing a focus group, recording some notes or creating these, these analytical memos that help you understand what you're hearing and what you're seeing um, and what you're thinking about that data. But you can also code letters and diaries and personal communications, uh, books, book chapters and articles, uh, recipes, song lyrics, poetry, pictures, drawings, paintings, uh, television shows, movies, and commercials. And if you're a collector of things like I am, I have my baseball cards, I could code my baseball cards. I never will because I don't even properly organize my baseball cards, but I could go through the process of coding my baseball cards. So if there is text for you to work with or if there's an image that you can then describe, you can code it. 
And with that in mind, I actually would like to see if we could take a quick coding break. So I want you all to think about this process of coding and how anyone can actually code as long as they know what they're supposed to be looking for. So if I gave you this picture on the screen here and asked you what code would you assign to this image if it was taken as part of a study about use of the library, what's a word or a phrase or multiple words or phrases you might apply to this. Um, and so if you feel comfortable, hop into the chat and let me know what you think. And I think I can still see the chat here. I see some stuff popping in there. Yep, we're seeing already collaboration, group, collaboration, collaboration, group study, collaboration. Ah, technology. I was hoping somebody would notice like a couple of technologies in there. Collaboration, technology, laptop, comfortable seating, youth. Okay, okay. Computer use, teens YA, mm -hmm. teen group, services available, space. Nice. I'm waiting to see if anybody notices a little bit of the background. I didn't notice it yet. Anybody take a look at the background a little bit? Enclosed, secure, books. Yep. Library use, library. Yep. Ah, flexible use. I like that. Now, one thing you'll probably all notice here is that some of the things you pulled were what we would call pretty obvious, right? You, you notice the technology, their group. Um, other things, you probably started noticing you were applying some ideas of what you think are there. So I saw teen YA. So we made an assumption about the age of, of this the group in this image, um, teen space, that type of thing. And yes, based on the picture, we're probably right, but it would be interesting to, to if you were doing an observation study and then you had a chance to then talk to the people in the picture to find out if they really were teens or YA, or maybe they're slightly older than we think. Uh, but that's very interesting. Um, I also like the idea that people are noticing that they look comfortable, so the application of comfortable seating. Um, but it's very interesting to see that we often see very similar things, but other people might have noticed other things first. But if you look at all this, you see you have generated a subset of probably, I'm going to say, 12 codes just for one picture. And so this is how multiple people could actually go through and code. And if we were doing this together, we would get together and start thinking about which term we wanted to use. So we would ask ourselves whether or not laptop was the more important thing or would technology be better? Or would it be better to have technology as our, our main code and then a subcode of laptop. So we would have those conversations as part of the process. But thank you all for engaging in that for me. I hope that that was at least stimulating as we get into the how we would continue doing this for our other work. Now, one of the questions we usually get asked is when should you actually start your coding? And the best answer is throughout the process. So if you are conducting interviews and focus groups, you want to start looking at your data almost right away. And you want to start coding that data, at least thinking through the process of coding that data as soon as you start collecting it. Now, you can, of course, code all your data after it's all been collected. And that works best if your data was collected over a really short period of time. So say there's multiple groups who were doing observations across a couple of days and all that data is just coming in. You've got your data, you just start going through it and doing your coding. But if your study is a little more extended and taking place over a series of weeks or even months, you don't want to let your data sit there and linger. You want to make sure that you are diving in and paying attention to that data as you go through the process. Um, now, one reason we do that is so that we don't lose sight of the data or what's there if we keep it fresh. The other thing is sometimes that data can influence the work you're already doing. So you might find out that there are questions you need to continue asking as part of your focus group or your interview that you didn't ask initially, but you're seeing in the data that it's important. Or you may find that you've been doing observation studies and you're starting to notice something that's not on your protocol. That was not something that you said to look for, but it's coming up and it's, it seems to be important. So now now we need to make sure we're paying attention to that information as well. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that no matter when you actually start this process of, of coding, it's going to be cyclical. You're going to be coming back to the data. You're going to go through it once. You're going to come back at least one more time. So it's typically a minimum of two cycles that you go through. And coding is very dynamic. So what you often find is that your initial codes may not be the best ones and you may change them, 
or they may have to grow a little bit, or you may have to introduce something else, but you're going to go through this process throughout. And let's say we had a really good question. Wouldn't that introduce a bias to change as you go? Yes, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, but how we manage that bias as well, and, and why it's actually okay to go through this process and identify these things to pick out. There's going to be ways to work with it. So really great question, though, Samantha. Okay, so this also means we talk about ourselves as coders because you, in essence, are an instrument of this process. You are important to this process, and it's really important that you are uh, paying attention to how organized you are. Um, and if you're not an overly organized person, coding may not be your favorite thing. You may need to hire someone or get someone to help you with coding. Um, you need to persevere. I mentioned that you'll have a lot of data it can start feeling really tedious. You start reading through things. The first time you code, you're like, okay, can I just stop now? Nope, you gotta go back, you gotta read it again. Um, you also need to deal with ambiguity. There's gonna be times where things just aren't gonna be clear and you're gonna have to try to come up with a way to better understand what you're seeing, um, but also be flexible in that process and creative. You, you do need to be creative. Uh, coding is actually a creative activity. Um, and you also need to make sure that you are paying attention to your ethics here. So you need to be rigorously ethical and honest in this process. Um, and one of the suggestions that we often see is that you need an extensive vocabulary. And I put an asterisk here because I actually disagree. You definitely need to have a vocabulary that is relevant to the topic that you're looking at. So if your vocabulary is libraries, you're fine. But people who have overly extensive vocabularies, which means they know about 10 synonyms for every word, um, often struggle with coding because they usually can't pick a term, one word. They, it's hard for them to focus. And so it's actually harder for them to code because you'll see as they code that they keep applying variations of, of the term they're trying to get to and then they have to later on decide which one's best. So you don't need an overly extensive vocabulary, just mostly a vocabulary that aligns with the research that you're doing. But as we were just saying, um, you have to think about other aspects of this work. And bias is always a possibility. When we code, we code through a different lens. We code um, as a way of interpreting what we see or what we've heard. Um, and you have to think about which perspective you're actually using or which lens you're looking through when you're actually viewing the information. And so the reminder is what helps us to stay on track, what helps us with uh, potential bias is that we are focused on our research approach. So the interview process, we ask the questions, we're looking at the actual uh, text that was given to us. Um, we acknowledge our personal experiences and we acknowledge that our personal experiences may have impacted how we even collected the data, but could impact how we're now viewing the data. And making that acknowledgement early can help us to make sure we're not focusing only on what um, aligns with our personal experience. Also remembering that we probably have looked at the literature, we've read some stuff, and because of that, we may have certain terms or ideas in our head from the literature, so we acknowledge that as well. Um, we already probably have a research question and a hypothesis, which means that yes, we've already built in a little bit of bias here because we chose what to focus on, and we chose, or at least we've suggested what we think we're going to find in our data, which is fine, that's our hypothesis. Um, and then keeping in mind what the overall purpose and aim of our project is. So as you're looking through your lens at the data, always reminding yourself that this is the purpose of what I'm doing here. This is the aim of the project. Have I fulfilled that purpose or have I met that aim with the process of looking at the data? Have I focused on the right information? But you do wanna be aware of bias. And this is why you want to acknowledge your personal experience. You want to make sure you indicate if you are relying on the literature as you're looking through data. You wanna write down that hypothesis, that expectation, um, because there's gonna be a process, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to disconfirm things, but there's a process for making sure that you're balanced as you're doing your coding as well. Now, as we get started with coding, I mentioned you got all this data coming in, you're looking at it. Let's be honest, you're already looking at the data and coding a little bit, but there is an element of preparation that you want to do. So if you're dealing with your interviews and your focus groups, you need to have those in a textual form. So you need to create your transcripts and have those ready to go. If you're dealing with observations, you've got your field notes, you've got some memos. Um, you may also have some notes for your interviews and your focus groups. 
All those are now documents and they're ready for you to code but you wanna make sure you set them up in a way that works for you. And I am not gonna sit here and tell you what the best layout is. Uh, Saldana tells you what they think the best layout is. Um, I'm gonna tell you that you may have to go through trial and error to figure out which layout works the best for you. So you may find that you like to use Microsoft Word, and you like to lay them out, just here's the text and I'm gonna go through and work with it. Um, you may be like me, I like having extra columns. I put everything in tables. I like being able to type in my columns. I have other people I know who just want one column on the left or the right, depending on how their, their brain is usually structured. But again, that's a process of you figure it out as you start practicing your coding. Now, you also want to decide if you want to do this manually or computer assisted. I am not a fan of printing things out and highlighting and adding notes. Um, to me, I just can't keep track of things that way. I have a colleague, that's how they code. And she does it beautifully. And I admire the way her brain works. And she does like to print out her transcripts and she likes to highlight them in different colors. And she uses her small post-it notes. That's her approach. I am very much a computer assistant in terms of using Microsoft Word to highlight and type notes um, and not worry about my handwriting. Um, I also have a colleague who does hers on an iPad using a stylus. And so she actually writes in cursive on her notes and nobody can actually read her handwriting but her. Um, but there's also programs out there. Um, you know, Some of you may have heard of InVivo. Um, there's also a program called Deduce, which is a little more accessible for those of us who might not be either at research centers or on major campuses. Um, InVivo can be a little more expensive to work with. Deduce is one that's been and touted, depending on your ability to work with technology, as a little more accessible for researchers who are trying to also work together. Uh, but you need to make that decision as you're going through the process. And it's actually perfectly okay if there are two people working together and one is coding online and one is coding on paper. It can work. You just have to get together and think through that process of how are we going to now work together when we're doing our coding. Oh, and I like this. Selena was saying also uh, tag it. It's a, uh, and I thank you for uh, actually sharing the proper spelling. I always say it wrong. Um, it's another free option as well. So thank you for that, Lena. All right. So I mentioned that you're reading all this data. Well, you also do some pre-coding. And what pre-coding is, is essentially what I do when I'm just reading through my transcripts. I'm not quite coding yet. I'm just familiarizing myself again with the data. Um, and in some instances, you may not be the person who did the interview or the focus group or even the observation. You may just be reading what's there. So it's good for you to go through and familiarize yourself with this data, but at the same time, Take note of anything that just seems significant as you're reading through it. You might see a word or a phrase, or you might see an entire quote that just feels important. You don't know why. You just know it feels important. So you highlight it, you circle it, you underline it, but you just take note of it because you're going to come back to it in the coding and it'll make more sense later. But you want to go ahead and sort of tag it as you're going through. Um, this is actually really important if you do need to pull quotes later. And I've found that it's so much easier for me to pull an important quote uh, from, from someone, their words, if I've already done this pre-coding process. Um, and again, don't worry about it not making sense at that time. This is just you familiarizing yourself with the data and making sure that you're feeling comfortable with what you're looking at. Oh, yes. And thank you for putting the do deduce in there and spelling that. So yes, so so D-E-D-O-O-S-E -O -O -E, <laughs> um, is that program. And hopefully they fixed the issue they were having with using um, the technology that didn't always work on all computers. I think that's been corrected. Now, the other thing you do, I mentioned interviews, focus groups, um, observations, you're, you're taking notes as you were collecting the data. These are part of what you're going to be able to code as well, or at least look at to help you with your coding. And so as you were writing up your fill notes, or if you actually manually transcribe your interviews and focus groups, um, I recommend you do that once in your life for the experience and then never do it again, because that will, will break your brain. Uh, but it's actually supposed to be a, a positive way for you to, again, familiarize yourself with your data, to transcribe it yourself manually. But anytime you're looking at this information and you, you've taken notes, this is part of your process. 
And I mentioned when we talked about uh, observations and, and those types of qualitative research that keeping a research journal also helps and having analytic memos that you've described what you're seeing or feeling when you looked at data, all that's going to come in handy as you're actually thinking through your coding process. Um, and the only thing you will see is that your notes and these things that you jot down are not your final codes. These are just things that you were paying attention to and they may influence your final codes, but they're not going to actually be the final codes that you apply. And then we remind you to also stay focused. So a few things to keep in mind as you're looking at the data, um, you're thinking about what people are doing and, or what they're describing that they do, um, how they talk about the things that are going on either in their lives or if you ask them to describe how they use the library. Um, see if you notice any assumptions that are already being made from what they're saying or what was described in the observational data. Um, and what do you see? going on in that data. What do you learn from your notes? What did your notes sort of hint at? And also ask yourself, why did I include those in my notes? Like I made a statement about the structure of the shelves. Why did I include that? It's reminding you to pay attention to why you thought it was important and reconnect it to the data. And then also think about how what you're seeing is similar or different from other recorded information, so other literature that's already been published, and what is the significance of the event or activity that's being described? And the final three questions, what surprised you, what intrigued you, or what disturbed you about the data that you were actually reading? Now, a few additional coding tips. Uh, don't try to code everything. There's a lot of textual data. I just conducted an interview with a colleague and it was two hours. There's no way that we're gonna be able to find everything in a two hour transcript of, of coded data, but you're going to want to immerse yourself in it. So just code what feels important. And as you go through and your second round of coding, if you do a third round, things become more relevant. They start making more sense as you go through it. Again, it's why you code more than once. Uh, be selective with your codes, but the goal is to use codes repeatedly. So you create a code and you use that code again as you're going through the data because the idea is that these codes or these ideas should be connecting. And it's okay to create subcodes and actually sub-sub codes um, and create sort of a hierarchy. There's nothing wrong with that. You will clean all of that up later in your process. Now, typically when we talk about coding, you'll hear people talk about two approaches, deductive and inductive. And so deductive coding just means that you start out with what they call a set of a priori codes. It's like a list of codes that you expect to apply to your data uh, because you've already predetermined based on your literature review, based on your hypothesis, or based on your pre-existing coding system, which can be something based on a theory that someone created already, this theory of library use. Or if you were like Kuthal's theory of, of research and berry picking, you want to see how well what people tell you aligns with that theory, you already have this predetermined set of codes that you're expecting to apply. So deductive coding is recommended if you already have a conceptual framework if you already have research questions, um, or if there are other aspects of your research where there might be certain codes or certain themes or concepts that are likely to appear. So there's like an expectation that you're going to see these things. Um, if your research is very theory driven, again, something like Kuthal's theory, that's something that would be better with deductive coding because you know you're going to expect to find some things. Um, and if your research is targeting uh, something very specific, something that people already know a little bit about or quite a bit about and have talked about, you're probably going to have codes based on those experiences. Now, inductive coding means that you're entering this process with an open mind and no preconceived ideas of what you're going to find. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to be impossible for you to never have a preconceived idea of what you're going to find in your data, even if it's exploratory, because there's always an expectation of something. But if you're doing inductive coding, you're just not going in with that pre-identified list of specific codes that we're going to apply to this data. I'm just going to read through everything. I'm going to learn as I go. And so you create your original codes more spontaneously. So as you go through that data, that first actual review, you're creating codes as you're going through the data. 
And we often rely on what we call in vivo codes. And these are the ones where we use the words that are actually in the data. This usually works best for interviews and focus groups because it's the words of your participants. You don't necessarily need in vivo codes from observational studies um, because that's usually coming from you or a colleague, they've written that down. Now, it doesn't mean that you or your colleague didn't have one of those epiphanies and write down the perfect code and that's okay, the word works. Uh, but in vivo codes usually apply to interview focus group the words of your participants. Now, inductive coding is considered to be more time consuming than deductive, than deductive coding because you're having to think through the process of what you're seeing and come up with a code that makes sense for that data. So very much a data-driven approach. Um, a lot of people apply this when they're doing you know, grounded theories, ethnographies, phenomenologies. I'm just gonna tell you now that if you have interviewed anyone and you've done your research, even if you've got deductive codes, you're still gonna wanna do inductive coding. Let's put it that way. So yes, you can overlap your coding. You can do both deductive coding and inductive coding. And this goes back to our question about bias. How do we make sure we're not overly biasing what we see? Deductive coding introduces bias because you're looking for something very specific. It's not bad bias. You're trying to see what aligns with the research. You're trying to see what aligns with the theory. But if you only focus on deductive coding, you may miss something important, especially if it doesn't align with the theory or with previous research. So even if you did start out with deductive coding, you come back, you do inductive coding afterwards. You look for the things that don't ne necessarily match. You look for the things that are different or distinct, something that was unexpected. That helps you to also balance what you're finding. And I'm not going to say eliminate bias, but help you keep the bias or potential bias under control. Now, the other thing you have to do, and it's so important that you do this, is create a code book. It's almost like a master cookbook that you're gonna be working with. Um, and this is where you have a record of all the codes that you use during your coding process. And so what I usually do is every time I create a code, I stop and I write that code down and I also define what that code means. And I include an example of what I pulled that code for. So it might be the, the little patch of text from the interview or from the focus group. And that's how you create your code book. Uh, now you can create a code book beforehand, especially if you're doing deductive coding um, and add more onto it. Once you go back and do the inductive coding as things emerge, uh, you want to make sure that you include those descriptors though, because even if it's just you doing the coding, you want to make sure you're consistent with your coding and you need that code book to help you with the consistency. If you're working with someone else, the code book makes sure that everyone is doing their coding in the same way, that they're looking for the same things, that there's agreement about what they're looking for. And so this code book is a way for you to organize things. Um, you can also use it to reorganize your codes into categories because as you're developing them, or if you already have them, you see if they start fitting into groups, you start noticing a pattern. Um, so again, very useful if you have multiple researchers across multiple sites or multiple participants, uh, but even for yourself, have your code book there and ready to go, a reference for you to come back to. All right, so that's the overview of all the coding, which you're thinking that's enough, Dr. Bright, but <laughs> now we're going to talk about the fact that there are so many different coding approaches that fit underneath both the, the deductive and inductive approaches. And these are the ones that Saldana shares, and I'm going to share most of them with the caveat that not all of them will make sense for the type of work we do in libraries, um, but some of them are going to be interesting to consider trying for, I want to look at my data this way. So we focus a lot on that first cycle of coding because of how important it is. And remember, this is just our initial coding of the data. And Saldana tells us that we can do this grammatically, elementally, with effective, you know, looking at the effect of things, uh, literature and language, exploratory or procedural. And underneath all of these are the very specific ways that you can code. And what you'll notice here is that I've given you a definition of what the grammatical coding is, but I've also highlighted the, like, the ones that make sense. Like you might want to try this or look at coding. Keep in mind, 
again, you can overlap your coding. You don't have to use only one coding approach. You can have multiple approaches. So the grammatical approach is really just looking at basic grammatical principles of a technique, which tells you absolutely nothing. But if you look at the different examples here, uh, the three I highlight, attribute coding, really important if you're trying to get a sense of the demographic characteristics of your participants. And this is just a good way that you can apply at the beginning of any of your interview focus group data sets or even your observations as a way to describe the people, the setting, um, the overarching view of what's there. And so these are actually just really nice for later on when you're trying to categorize and look for comparisons, you understand what the attributes are of your participants or of the place that you're you're looking at. Now, subcoding is just a reminder that you can actually go through and add tags or add codes um, underneath other codes. So you have a primary code, one that's very, you know, there and detailed, um, but you might have subcodes and it's perfectly fine to have subcodes. When we were looking at our picture, I was talking about technology and laptop. Well, Technology is probably your higher order code, but laptop would just be a subcode that you would find there. Um, you might even decide if you want one that's laptop, MacBook, PC, depending on what you're actually looking at as well. But it's perfectly fine to have subcodes underneath your main codes. Um, and then simultaneous just means that you apply two or more codes to the same piece of data, the same passage, the same sentence, the same quote. Um, and the overlap is there because it's in recognition of the complexity of what you're looking for. It's very common for you to read a sentence, read someone's response, and recognize that there's three or four things going on there, not just one idea. And so you code simultaneously, you apply multiple codes to that same piece or that same passage. Now, elemental is just this idea of using basic or focus filters for reviewing your data and building your foundation for future coding. So a lot of the coding that people do is elemental coding. And I highlighted descriptive coding here because this is just where you put some basic labels onto your data as a way to create an inventory of the topics that are there. This works really well for observational uh, research, so non-interview data. In vivo coding, we talked about that already, the importance of using the words from the participants, allowing them to speak for themselves and creating codes from their terms. Um, so like if you're doing an interview with someone in a library setting and they keep saying things along the lines of, you know, I felt bullied or there was this bullying mentality, then you're like, oh, maybe bullying is one of the codes that I would use here. Um, and I would work from that because that's the code, that's the word they actually used. Um, and then your initial codes, of course, uh, these are your codes and categories that uh, from first review. So you just did your initial coding. Um, it's usually a good way to incorporate those in vivo codes. Here again, you see the overlap of these approaches. Um, something called process coding, which is just looking at the description of a process. Um, the, the GTs you see here mean that these are common approaches found in grounded theory approach. Um, I just make sure I labeled those as I was going through. Now, effective means that you're looking at the subjective qualities of human experience um, and trying to acknowledge and name those experiences. So these are really good, or this is a really good approach for coding if you're dealing with uh, questions or interview data, uh, data from focus groups, where you ask people to explain their experience to you, how they experienced um, a program or experienced use of the library. And so the two that I pulled that were usually most applicable to what you do are emotion, so going through and labeling the feelings that they experience. So if people talk about doing library research and they say, I was really scared, or I was really anxious, you're really invested in understanding the emotions that are coming from those experiences. So you would do a type of emotional coding as you go through. Evaluation, of course, means that you're trying to look at the data in terms of determining whether or not a program or a policy has merit or has worth. And so, of course, in libraries, that works really well for us. We want to go through and code specifically for the value of the program or the value of what people got from the program. So we're doing more of an, of an evaluative coding process. Now, most of us will probably not use literary and language coding, even though if you have a background in writing, 
some of these might fascinate you. But the one I do pull is the verbal exchange one. And even if you're not doing ethnographic research where you're looking at how people in a culture work together, there is a reason to pay attention to the conversation that takes place. So this works really well for focus groups because if the focus group went really well, there was conversation between the participants. And you're looking at that conversation and trying to see if it reflects on how people uh, talk to each other, the social practices, um, or how they interpret what they're seeing or saying as well. Now, exploratory, I actually highlighted all of these because this is basically one of the, the four different ways people tend to approach looking at their data. Um, basically creating a more refined system. You're using this as a way to kind of get through things. Holistic coding just means you apply a single code to a large unit of data. A lot of times you'll see holistic coding applied to the entire interview, just a way to describe the entire interview um, that you did. I conducted an interview with someone recently and I told my colleague, we're gonna call this, um, uh, hindsight is, is um, you know, uh, things are clear when you look in the rearview mirror, something like that, because that was the essence or the overarching view of the, uh, the entire interview process. And so having that holistic code can help you to understand the sense of what's inside that data. Um, and you're still going to, again, have other codes that go with it. Uh, provisional codes, again, this is just starting with the start list. So deductive coding. Hy hypothetical or hypothesis coding means you came in with an idea of what the hypothesis was. And as you're looking at the data, you're looking for anything that both confirms, but also disconfirms your hypothesis, what you predicted. This is the balance again for the bias. So even if you have a hypothesis of what you expect to find, you want to make sure that you're looking for things that both confirm and those that disconfirm that hypothesis as well. And then eclectic coding is what I call the um, throw in the kitchen sink. So it's just you apply a variety of coding approaches and, and basically see what makes the most sense as you're going through your data. Now, procedural coding I listed here, but I am not going to include this process because most of the time we do not apply these. These are really high level detailed processes for coding that usually include having uh, looking at the actual method of data collection and data analysis as well. So I do include them in the slides for anyone who wants to do more in a research later, but I typically do not recommend that most of us need this for the type of data we have in libraries. Now, once you've done all that first cycle coding, you're going to move to your second cycle coding. Um, and so what do you do with the codes and data from your first cycle? You know, you've got all this information now. So some of the things you can do is go ahead and do a frequency count, see, see how often the code actually appeared, start looking for those patterns, uh, start putting things into categories, try to outline either a categorical order, a hierarchical order, some order of the information you're seeing. Um, go ahead and start doing that recoding if you're seeing where um, you've used similar terms for things that should have been coded one way or another. Um, and actually go ahead and start transforming your codes and themes as well if you start seeing those themes appear. Now, if you're looking for themes or patterns, just keep in mind that a pattern is just repetitive, regular, or consistent occurrences of action or data that appear more than twice. So if you see something in your data and it only appears once, not a pattern. Uh, if it appears twice, uh, could be just coincidence, not a pattern. But if it occurs more than two times, you probably have a pattern and you want to take note of that. Also, this is a good way for you to determine how trustworthy is this data that I have. Um, patterns are usually an indication of significance or salience of information. So you want to see patterns. You want to see repetition. Um, and also, this is a good way to turn observations that you had of the data into something more concrete. So your initial codes are your initial observations. And now I want them to be more concrete. So I'm going to have a theme or a pattern. Um, and these themes, again, are just a way for you to categorize and describe these codes that you have. Um, helps you to bunch them together in a way that makes sense and helps you to start telling a story about all this data that you have. Now, if you're actually doing this categorization, um, there are some patterns you can look for. So you can look for similarity. So things tend to happen in the same way for this different people when you ask the question about their experiences. Uh, you can look for difference, so things that happen in a different way, but it starts to seem predictable that you would expect it to happen in a different way based on 
those experiences. You can look for frequency in terms of how often things or how seldom things happen. Uh, you can look for a sequence of things. Things are happening in a certain order. So every time someone mentions that they started using the library at this age, we automatically notice that they expressed X, Y, or Z about their library use uh, behavior. You can look for correspondence. So things happen in relation to something else happening. So every time someone mentions X happening, we notice that they also then mention Y happens as well. And then you can actually start looking for causation, even though keep in mind, we're talking about qualitative data and we're not doing a causal study, but you can start looking for things that seem to appear to cause something else to happen. You're more likely to find correspondence than you are to find causation, but you can at least start looking for it. The other thing we talk about is the distinction between coding, codifying, and synthesizing things. So codifying is just where we take the codes that we had, we apply them to the data so that we can then divide that, group it, reorganize it, um, and try to make some type of meaning or develop an explanation from it. So that's what the process of codifying the data is. But synthesis is where we actually spend time combining different things to make something new. Um, so this is how you transition from just your codes to your categories. And it's a way for you to create this meaning in the form of a theme or a concept that's usually easier for other people to understand. So you may have heard this called thematic analysis. And you know a theme can be any way that you want to identify this unit of data, uh, what it means. Uh, your interpretation, your themes are your interpretation that summarizes for others what you think you see in this data. Um, and people may say thematic analysis is the same as creating a category or a group for the data. Um, so it's just, again, bringing meaning or understanding to the pattern that you've discovered in your data by looking at your codes. Let me see if we have a question here. Uh, Karen, could you let me know which screen? Do I need to go back a screen? Ah, correspondence versus causation. So yes, they actually go back. So this actually is important. So correspondence just means that you feel that things are happening because something else is also happening. So there's a relationship there. You don't know what the relationship is. You don't know if one's causing the other. You just know that these things tend to keep occurring together. Like I keep seeing these, these uh, particular actions or um, uh, responses to questions and they all seem to keep occurring together, but you don't know if one's causing the other, um, if there's something in between causing both, you just know they keep appearing together in your particular transcript from an interview, in your observational studies. Um, causation is where you think you have a clear indication that one thing is clearly causing the other thing to happen. You know which one came first and you know it's causing the other one to happen. So hopefully that clarifies a little bit. All right, so let's hop back over here. I didn't want to show you an example of what coding might look like from data. So this is just a short transcript. I know this is hard to see from an observational study that I actually did when I was a PhD student sitting in the academic commons of a library and basically just seeing how people use the space. And so I was just kind of typing on my computer, pretending like I wasn't actually watching people. And I took note of things that were said, what I overheard, what I saw. And I started creating codes for my data. And you can see how I color code things when I code through. But I started noticing things like people working individually or in groups, uh, working with technology and the type of technology, uh, whether they were having personal conversations or class related conversations. Uh, were they eating? Um, how are they using personal space? And did they respect other personal spaces? Uh, what did they do with their personal items, security of their, their items, and people who were just passing through? And so from that, I created this um, larger grouping. The themes that I was seeing were work style. That was where individual and group went. Uh, interactions, were they personal conversations or school-based? Uh, personal behaviors, which was awareness of personal space or security of personal items. And then what I themed as general activities, because there really wasn't anything else um, using technology, eating, passing through. And this was just a, a quick way for me to learn how to do this process and see what I could actually determine from the data um, and then go through and, and figure out how could I group this together. And you find yourself surprised that if you go back and look at the data, say two years later, three years later, you might see different things in your own data, but 
even from this short passage, you could easily go through and code something and from your perspective, create this sense of a theme or a process and create these overarching themes or categories as well. Now, the other thing we talk a little bit about, since we have all this textual data and we're pulling things, is can we map things? Can we landscape a little bit? And so you actually can do what they call visual thematic mapping. And this is just a way for you to visually organize your themes or your sub-themes and any relationships you're starting to see between those themes. Um, programs like Invivo and Deduce, and um, I'm not sure about Tag, I haven't tried that one yet, but they offer usually offer a way for you to thematically map your codes as well. Uh, code mapping that you can do by yourself as well. It's just using the preliminary analysis of the codes, um, usually before or before you do or concurrent with your second cycle coding. So from the first coding, um, you list all your codes out, you put them in categories, what goes with what, and then you recategorize them as a way to sort of streamline what you're seeing. So it's just a way for you to kind of bring it back down and focus a little bit um, and can help you when you audit your research process. So did I have a lot of overlap? Why do I have so much overlap? That type of thing. Uh, code landscaping, just think word clouds or text clouds. So having a system show you visually uh, what shows up more frequently, it's a way to integrate text and visual methods to, to see your data. All right, so final thing to talk about also is who is coding this data. So um, if you're coding by yourself, I always encourage you to get someone else to come back and check your codes, uh, to come back and check your process. And also consider if it's interviews or focus groups, having the people you interviewed look at the codes as well and see if they think they make sense for what they told you in those interviews and focus groups. If you're coding with other people, it's all about coordination, just working together, creating that code book, identifying someone to be the editor. Multiple people should not be editing the code book. That can just get dangerous and, and different views show up. If you have more than five coders, you're gonna have too many cooks in the kitchen. Try to avoid having more, more than five coders. And then make sure you've set your strategies beforehand for how you're going to handle disagreements and, and come to understanding when your codes don't necessarily align. You also typically want to check inter-rater inter reliability. It's hard to say. Um, typically, this is a way for you to make sure that there is true agreement going on between those who are coding, so across multiple coders. Um, you can actually do this with statistics. I'm not going to walk you through that. But if you can look up what they call the Kappa coefficient or even Pearson's R and look up inter-rater reliability, there's a way to tell you how to go through and check for um, the, the agreement of your codes. You're looking for about 80 to 90 percent agreement. Um, that's usually the benchmark between different coders. Um, you can also check yourself. You can do intra coder reliability checking to make sure you've applied your codes, your own codes, um, in a way that's been consistent and, and really makes sense for the data. Works really well if you have standardized and semi-structured data. Um, if you've got unstructured interviews where you just kind of walked up to somebody and talked to them, I wouldn't try checking that. It's going to be a little bit too difficult as well. All right, and I think I've talked way too long. You'll have access to these resources. There's some really interesting information here for anyone who'd like to look things up, including looking up uh, Saldana's book, which is, is a good option as well.